Vision Arms released a new podcast yesterday called Parting the Veil, which is supposed to peel back the curtain on Pantheon Rise of the Fallen's development and answer the biggest questions about it once and for all. The first episode tackles one of the most fundamental questions about Pantheon that's not as obvious as it may seem, and that is, who is this game actually made for? There's a word that often gets thrown around when talking about Pantheon, and whether or not it even has a place in today's MMORPG landscape. That word is niche, or niche, or however you want to pronounce it, but I pronounce it niche, and Vision Realms has obviously seen this term applied to Pantheon, and they feel that it's a misnomer and enough of a misconception that it needs to be addressed. Sometimes misconceptions like this arise because people are using the same term for different concepts. Some words have different meanings to different people, so one person might say that Pantheon is a niche game, and based on what they think niche means, they might not be far off. But if the person listening has a different understanding of what niche means, when they hear that, then their understanding of what Pantheon is might be way off. If you want to better your understanding of Pantheon, hit the subscribe button now because this channel is dedicated to following its development closely. I'm not affiliated with Vision Realms, I've just been tracking the project for a long time, and I like to share what I learn to make it easier for you to track it with me. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll know that I am a huge fan of defining terms when discussing big topics. Because if we don't, like I said earlier, conversations have a tendency to devolve over time until no one really knows what anyone is saying anymore. So just so we can all get on the same page here, this is how Pantheon's creative director, Chris Joppa Perkins, defines niche. Uh, niche, to me, means that you're talking about a thing, a, a, an experience, a hobby, a product, uh, a movement, whatever it may be, that because of its very peculiar and specific constraints and edges and shape, it, it is only palatable and consumable by a very small subset of people. Okay, so that will be the basis of the discussion for the rest of this video. One of the primary reasons why I think Pantheon often gets labeled as a niche game is due to another label that gets misattributed to it. Hardcore. And actually, I would put old school in that category as well. Again, these are loaded subjective terms that have many different definitions depending on who you ask, so they should really never be used without explaining exactly what you mean. To some people, hardcore can just mean an MMO that's really difficult from a player skill standpoint and doesn't hold your hand and always tell you exactly where to go like a lot of other MMOs out there do. And with this definition of hardcore, that's a pretty accurate, if not brief, description of Pantheon's design. But to others, hardcore can mean an MMO that requires mindless grinding and camping an open world boss for 18 hours just to get anything done, and maybe losing all your gear if you die. And if we use this definition of hardcore, that's when we really start to lose touch with what Pantheon actually is. Especially if we then jump to conclusions about, well, if Pantheon is hardcore, then it'll probably also have these other features that I've seen in other games that I consider hardcore, etc, etc. After enough repetition, these subtle misunderstandings end up having a big impact on our understanding of what Pantheon is, even at its most basic goals. And before you know it, there's swaths of people claiming that Pantheon can't succeed because it'll only ever have X amount of players because it has this feature and that feature, etc, etc. All this before they've even ever played it in alpha. Now, on one hand, if we did use that definition of hardcore, it's easy to see why a brutal game that requires long consecutive play sessions to make progress or even avoid losing progress would end up being seen by many as a niche game. On the other hand, that's not what Pantheon is aiming for. 
When it comes to Pantheon specifically, the statement that Pantheon is not going to be either of those things, it's not being designed to be a niche game, nor do I foresee it becoming a, a niche game based on its design or based on its experience. I can say, first of all, we are not interested in designing a niche game just for the sake of being niche. Uh, we're not looking for specific game design principles or approaches to game design that are going to alienate potential fans of the game. But wait, 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 wait. I thought Pantheon was designed to appeal to old school EverQuest players. Well, before you start furiously writing a comment about how Pantheon has sunk to just trying to be another WoW clone or some nonsense like that, let's fact check whether or not Pantheon was ever designed to just be for the old school hardcore crowd. And to do that, let's go all the way back to episode 6 of the Community Q&A series in January 2014, just two weeks after Pantheon was first announced as a Kickstarter project. This is Visionarum's late founder, Brad McQuaid, answering whether Pantheon would appeal more to EverQuest or Vanguard players. So Pantheon is designed to appeal to all sorts of people. We do, you know, we have described a target audience of more dedicated players who want a challenging game and enjoy grouping and working together with friends, being on a team and fulfilling a role. But there, you know, those people are everywhere. We're, we want to see people from way back with EverQuest 1, people who enjoyed Vanguard, uh, players who play more difficult console games, um, all sorts of people that are looking for that challenge. We're not really just saying, hey, we're making this for old school EQ1 players or this or that. I mean, there's modern functionality in there as well as certainly an influence from both EverQuest 1 and Vanguard in terms of game mechanics. But we think this will have a, an appeal to quite a lot of people regardless of, of age or, or where they're at in life right now. By the way, if you're wondering how I found this clip from so long ago, check out the Library of Pantheon, which is a website I helped build where you can easily find direct links to everything Vision Realms has ever said about Pantheon. Visit www.libraryofpantheon.com if you want to refresh your memory or maybe even discover some things you never even knew about Pantheon. In this clip, we clearly hear that since day one, Pantheon was never intended to be a niche game that appealed exclusively to old school EverQuest and Vanguard players. But that doesn't mean it was intended to appeal to everyone either. That's where the term target audience comes in. And again, this is a case where differentiating between a niche and a target audience is really important to avoid any further misunderstandings. You could say that a niche is a target audience, but a target audience is not always a niche. Certainly not with the definition of niche that we're using in this video. A target audience can be quite broad. As a quick example, it's safe to assume that players who strictly play solo and want to just log in and relax and play mindlessly while still progressing through content just like everyone else, won't find Pantheon to be very enjoyable. But even if you ignore that entire demographic, that still leaves a wide spectrum of players for your target audience. And later in this video, Joppa will clarify where on that spectrum Pantheon is. But to unpack this further, let's go to Brad's personal blog post in August 2016 titled Pantheon New Features and New Players. Quote, I truly believe a significant percentage who haven't experienced the magic of EverQuest in earlier games will love Pantheon, and it's important both to us and you all that we bring those people in and take care of them, at least short term, so they can acclimate. The only people I think this truly won't resonate with would be 1. Those who truly do just want us to make an EverQuest emulator, and 2. Those who really don't want any newbies in Pantheon, who would be content to have Pantheon merely be a haven for those of you who have felt abandoned and orphaned by the newer MMOs. If you fall into one or both of those categories, then I'm going to have to be really straight up with you. Pantheon isn't what you think or want it to be." End quote. Making a game that is merely a haven for those who have felt abandoned and orphaned by newer MMOs would be, by definition, a niche. But again, as we can see, that's never been the goal with Pantheon. 
So why does this seem to be so easily forgotten by many people? Well, aside from the lack of clear terms, it probably has something to do with the fact that we as humans tend to hear and remember what we want to hear and remember. Who wouldn't want an MMO to be designed specifically for them, with nothing in it that they don't like, and excluding anyone that disagrees? I know I would. The problem is that's rarely, if ever, the case. For example, when you hear that EverQuest and Vanguard players will probably enjoy Pantheon, but also a lot of other players who enjoy a challenging, cooperative, and immersive experience will enjoy it too, that would be a true statement. But it's far too easy for the old school EverQuest and Vanguard players to hone in just on that first part of that statement, and eh, just forget about everyone else. And keep in mind, I'm not ratting on old school EQ players at all. I'm an old school EQ player myself, and I know we don't all do that, but it does happen, and it doesn't help anyone. If you're gonna say that we're gonna try to make this game for this time period with these things, I feel like you leave a lot on the table. Do you agree with that? I mean, do you think about that when you're designing? Do we don't wanna be limited by something that was kind of set up so long ago? That's a great question, and it, it is very much a part of the design process when you're dealing with inspiration, or you're dealing with forerunners that have come before. Uh, and that could be anything. That could be other MMORPGs. That could be, as I've mentioned before, you know, certain console era, you know, early classic console era game experiences that are very, very relevant to you know my personal design philosophies and process. But they don't check all the boxes. They don't cover the full gamut of consideration. And they certainly don't completely in and of themselves, any one of them, any one of those inspirations speak to and answer all the questions that come with the current time and the current market and the current moment. So I would say, yeah, there, there, if, if you are tying yourself too, too much, if you're too bound up in any kind of a, a predecessor type experience, then it absolutely can limit and inhibit your ability to uh, problem solve and to evolve ideas and, and push them forward. But even if you were okay with a game that didn't really break any new ground, why? Why won't a company make an MMORPG just for you and the specific fandom you belong to? Well, ultimately, it comes down to basic math. MMOs take a lot of money to make and maintain, so if you want to be playing a game for any length of time, and MMOs in particular are more fun when you can really sink into them for years, the amount of players that would be willing to subscribe can't be limited to just one small group. This is kind of a hard pill to swallow, because it usually involves some sort of compromise. It usually means the game including some features that we don't like or agree with, or not including some features we do like, because each player's preferences are unique, and it's just not realistic to expect a game to be made just for us. Now yes, that can be taken too far in the other direction, to the point where a game is trying to be so many different things to attract so many different types of players that it loses any sense of identity and maybe even ends up not fully resonating with any of them. But again, it's a wide spectrum. On one end, you can make a game that appeals to one specific fan base. On the other, you can make a game that tries to appeal to any and all gamers. There's a lot of room in between those two extremes. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, and because I still see some people claim that Pantheon has somehow changed its values since Brad McQuaid died, I'd like to remind you that this idea is nothing new to Pantheon. Again, from Brad's 2016 blog post, quote, if you do agree, however, that Pantheon needs to move things forward, be a modern game, incorporate new ideas, then please consider those that we've revealed and talked about, and those we will in the future, keeping all of the above in mind. 
And if you do agree or at least understand that having a financially successful game allows us to keep working on the game long term, please understand the need for us to reach some subset of the 15 plus million online gamers out there, and the need to proactively ease them into a game like Pantheon, the likes of which they've probably never experienced." End quote. So with that in mind, to tie this all together, let's go back to Joppa today. All of these games are products that require teams and companies behind them to continue to be able to make them. There is money to be made by necessity in order to keep these projects going, to keep the games alive and growing. I mean, that, that's, that should be fully and completely and commonly understood. And, and there's nothing wrong with wanting it to be successful either. You know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with wanting to go beyond just keeping the lights on. You know, we, we want Pantheon to be a successful game uh, and have a long, vibrant future. But I guess the best way to explain this from my particular perspective is what I think about most in the process of designing Pantheon or discussing design decisions with other designers on the team and, and just overall shepherding the design of this game. It is it is truly about what kind of game, what kind of experience would be the most compelling game experience. What is going to be the most exciting and fulfilling and satisfying? And that's why when I think of Pantheon being thought of as a niche game, it's, it's difficult for me because I believe a lot of what we're tapping into is so much more of a shared desire among fans of this genre. Uh, and that is to step into a truly immersive and overwhelmingly large and deep world as a character that has incredible amounts of places to grow and ways to grow and progress and depths of the world and the setting and the cultures that are there for the taking. And there, there are so many aspects of what we're doing that I believe to be more fundamentally and universally compelling to just the adventurous spirit, the person who loves immersive adventure, that I, I can't, in light of that, I can't say this is only going to be for a few people. <laughs> If that sounds interesting to you and you want to learn more about whether Pantheon's design is something you'll enjoy, I'll include a link to the full podcast episode in the description below where they go into a bit more detail. This is just part one of their episode on whether or not Pantheon is a niche game, so stay tuned for my coverage of part two. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll know that I never suggest that you donate to Pantheon's crowdfunded development. Everyone has different financial situations and levels of risk tolerance, so what you do with your money is up to you. However, if you do make the decision to pledge, and my videos have in any way informed that decision, I'd appreciate it if you'd list me as a referral when you get your post-pledge survey. My account is bazgrimtv at gmail.com, and that helps me know that I'm covering the things that you want to know about. Another way that we can touch base is in the Bazgrim TV Discord channel. There's already a great group of people there where we've been discussing all aspects of Pantheon, staying up to date on the latest news and more. And if you want to get in on that, the link for that will be in the description or you can click on the card in the upper right now. I hope to see you there and I also hope to see you in the next video.